Uh, what's up, everybody? This is Brian with Where Rebels Are, streaming on Twitch. We talk about the market four days a week, and today, for our topic, we've decided to go ahead and tackle the issues of taxation, um, the wash sale rule, and the pattern day trade rule. So I'm going to be talking about these three different topics uh, going down uh, to hopefully help you understand the situation better. <laughs> Uh, recently in the week, there was a Forbes article that came out that uh, projected and said, hey, traders beware, as a trader has uh, ended up acc accumulating an 800,000, uh, yeah, 800,000 uh, dollar tax bill after actively trading. He had done this with only a starting capital of 45,000. What the article conveniently left out, however, was the amount of actual capital gains that this trader had. So we're going to talk about that uh, as, as kind of the base uh, of our discussion. And I hope that you walk away from this video understanding a little bit better that if you have a tax bill from your investing activity, that means you did something right. While nobody wants to take losses, we do need those to kind of offset uh, the gains. And hopefully I uh, do a good job of explaining how that mechanic works when it comes to actually filing your taxes. The first thing to understand uh, when you're paying taxes is the uh, capital gains tax. Uh, this will be a link made available. It is from Nerd Wallet, not sponsored content, by the way. This is just one that I found that kind of gives a, a nice introductory breakdown on the differences between short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains, and kind of helps you project out potentially what your overall tax liability will be. That being said, there are two uh, main investment account vehicles uh, that you're going to get into. A standard taxable account, uh, generally referred to as a cash account or a margin account or an individual brokerage account, but it is not designated for retirement. And that's the, that's the primary identifying factor. This means that any trading activity uh, that you partake in in that account is going to be taxable. A buy and a sell is going to result either in a net gain or a net loss, and gains in said account will be taxable. And then you have a retirement account, which is referred to as uh, a tax deferred account, or sometimes if you uh, sign up for a Roth, this could be a tax free growth account. The main difference between the Roth and a traditional IRA is in a traditional IRA, you are able to uh, lower the current year's income based on the amount you contributed. So you get a small tax break for contributing to the traditional IRA. However, when it comes time to withdraw your funds from the IRA, you are going to have tax event on the withdraw amount, and that's going to be taxed at whatever your current income bracket is in the year in which you withdraw the funds. The Roth IRA, on the other hand, you do not get a tax adv uh, advantage up front, meaning that the amount that you put in is not a write-off for your taxes. However, when you do take a withdrawal down the road, that withdrawal is allowed to be done tax-free because you paid taxes before you put the money in the account. The other thing to keep in mind is that with all retirement accounts, there are income limits and the Roth contribution limits are lower than the traditional IRA contribution limits. So understand that. And the limits are on the amount of income you make. Okay. And then it's also capped on the total dollar amount, which in the year of 2020 and 2021 is currently $6,000 for each year. If you happen to see this before April 16th, which I doubt uh, because it takes about two weeks for the video to get edited. But uh, if you do see it before then, consider talking to a tax advisor about the advantage of making a contribution to your retirement accounts because up until April 15th, you have the ability to contribute for last year's IRA contribution if you have not already. So there's the uh, base introduction to retirement accounts. Uh, hopefully you find that helpful. Then back to the topic of the day, and this is capital gains tax. Uh, if you hold a uh, investment over 12 months, uh, which is uh, the, the uh, cutoff time, so from let's say August 1st until August 1st the following year, that counts as 12 months, you then qualify for the sale of that position to qualify as long-term capital gains. It's generally better tax advantaged. If your income is below $40,000, you don't pay anything in capital gains. If your total income is above 40,000, but below 441,000, 
450 to be exact um, then you'll be taxed at 15 percent uh, and then it is over the 441 450 you'll be taxed at 20 percent and that's a better rate or level on the long term because when you talk about short term capital gains tax, you're actually taxed at your current income bracket. I'm not going to get into the income brackets, but uh, they range from uh, 10 to 37 percent, depending on how much money you're making. So as soon as you get over the low income bracket, uh, you move up to 22 percent, which is already higher by 7 percent more than the 15 percent long term capital gains. I understand that most people who see this video are going to be active traders. So the majority of your taxation is going to happen at whatever your income bracket is. Uh, and understand that capital gains uh, can influence your overall income. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit in detail on that uh, when you're filing. Here's a nice little calculator. So like I said, uh, NerdWallet's not sponsored uh, sponsoring this video, but I will link the link to their site so that you can play around with this calculator. But essentially you can put in information here like uh, what your purchase price for the securities were. You don't want to do this on your entire portfolio. So look at your uh, year end capital gain statement and just get the total number. It'll save you entering a hundred different things on this calculator when you don't need it. So let's say your total capital gains come to be about 85,000. You started with 20K, ended with 105,000. Ta-da, amazing year, $85,000 return. And then you put in what your income is, and this is gonna give you a nice breakdown on what your estimated capital gains. Uh, the reason I use this as an example is because I wanna highlight the fact that uh, your capital gains tax, uh, in this example here, going uh, to gain 85,000, is 12,750. It is not more than what you made. Okay. If for whatever reason, when you're filing your taxes, your tax bill comes out to be higher than your pre-tax capital gains number, talk to an accountant because you did something wrong. Seriously. The IRS is not going to tax you in such a manner as to take more than what you potentially earned. The capital gains tax is a tax on gains. So if you have losses throughout the year, and we'll get into the wash sale rule, and gains throughout the year, but your net gain amount is 85000 then your tax bill in this scenario example is going to be 12750 I set it to a time frame of more than one year. If I put it to less than one year, so this would be short term, it increases the tax bill by about $6,000. So it is now 18000 instead of 12000 779. So it is a higher tax bill because it's taking into account your capital gains and how much uh, your taxable income is. And it's giving us a total number here. It puts us in the bracket of the 24% marginal tax rate, and it tells us what our tax estimate is. So use this. Okay, if you're filing your taxes and it doesn't match close to what's coming up here using uh, this nerd wallet, wallet calculator, check your figures again. If you still can't figure it out, go talk to a tax professional because you should not pay more in taxes than what your capital gains is. And this this includes like let's say let's say I put the uh, actual income. So this is from your job, uh, your nine to five, your business, uh, whatever other source of income you have other than investing. Let's say I move it from ninety thousand to that uh, over the four hundred thousand limit that we saw. So five hundred thousand making bank. Your estimated tax bill on capital gains then moves up to thirty thousand twenty nine thousand seven fifty. Guess what? That number is still below your overall capital gain of 85,000. So hopefully this example kind of puts to rest the, the fact uh, or the questions or the challenges of my capital gains tax is going to be a problem. Because if you have actual capital gains, hopefully you didn't spend them uh, last year, then those capital gains uh, are going to have a tax, okay? Just like owning a business, if you have a business and uh, money comes in and money goes out, if you made money, the IRS is going to tax you on the money you made. Uh, that's just the way that the tax code works. So there you have it. There's the example. Check the link down below if you want to play with this calculator. On to the next topic. We're going to talk about the wash sale rule. So the, the difference between long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains is how much you're taxed at, okay? Long-term capital gains for most investors is actually advantageous because if you hold it over that one-year mark, your tax bill is exponentially lower, starting at the bottom lines at about 7%. Uh, better, which on a 15% is 66%, uh, so 30% discount, 
roughly, give or take, mm -hmm. it's roughly, uh, just in my head numbers. Uh, but uh, you're, you're getting, <laughs> uh, saving uh, about 30% on your taxes by holding it over a year. I get that trading is in vogue right now. Understand that the market conditions aren't going to always be favorable to that, even though it has been a very nice year for most active traders. Well, not most, a lot, uh, I should say, because I've seen a lot of people take losses as well. But it has been a, a favorable year to a lot of traders. And so they've been incented uh, to actively participate in the market get in get out get in get out and that brings us to the designation of a wash sale a wash sale is uh, specifically triggered and uh, it, it's uh, telling you here uh, kind of what the wash sale rule is and I have a link for the IRS that I will be including as well to talk about it. Oh wait, no, this is uh, dummies.com, so it's not the IRS's one, um, but uh, <laughs> I'm using uh, the dummies uh, definition and Schwab's definition here. Uh, the thing is, this is the same regardless of where your broker is. The wash sale is set in stone by the IRS to track people who used to participate in the practice of, I'm gonna sell out, I'm gonna take a loss so that I can write down my taxes, and then the very next day, I'm gonna buy back the security so that uh, I, I can continue to stay invested. So this was a rule that was put in place to track a rule that already existed. It's just the onus went out of the investor's hands, you and I, into your broker's hands. Now they are required to track this information, and as you file your taxes, if you have two separate brokers, you need to understand you can still trigger wash sale rules. Okay, because this rule has always been in effect. It's just that your broker is now responsible for reporting it. So the broker obviously can't produce or track trading activity that you do in someone else's account. So they're not responsible for that. But if you buy and sell in the same account within a 30 day period, you're going to trigger a wash sale. Um, so here's the, here's the wash sale rule. It, it occurs specifically when you sell a security at a loss and then you buy back the same or substantially identical. This is an important identifier because that means that you could technically end up triggering that if you were to say sell the SPY ETF and buy the VOO ETF, which is the Vanguard S&P 500 version. Technically, that constitutes to trigger the wash sale rule. So make sure you talk to an accountant and report it appropriately on your taxes. Other things could be trading options on the underlying security. While options are different uh, investment vehicle, it could still be considered substantially identical. So again, don't try to skirt the wash sale rule just to take capital losses on your account. It's auditable as not a good practice, but this is, this is what it's set up for. If you're being uh, affected by the wash sale rule, your loss will be disallowed and then added to the cost basis of the repurchase. So specifically triggering the wash sale rule entails buying a security, selling a security, and then after this sell transaction, sometime down the road, if you buy it again within 30 days, so before 31st day, that will trigger the wash sale rule. Okay, so for the whole next month, if you buy the security, you now have the wash sale rule. So that sale, if it, uh, it constituted a $5 loss, what's gonna happen is the next time you buy, it's actually increasing your cost basis uh, reporting by that $5, okay? Um, there's a nice example down here that talks about it, and I'm just gonna use that so that you can have something visually to read. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's say, uh, as an example, you buy 100 shares of XYZ for $10 per share. That's $1,000 worth of the stock. A year later, uh, the stock starts dropping. Uh, so you sell your 10, 100 shares for $8. Uh, that's a $200 loss that you're reporting. Three weeks later, uh, XYZ starts trading all the way down at six. You now decide that this is a good price uh, and you would like to purchase. So you go ahead and buy that 100 shares back for $600. Because the uh, purchase back uh, was done within 30 days of the sale, this is going to trigger a wash sale. As a result, the $200 loss that you initially reported is now added to the cost basis of the replacement stock. So your cost basis goes from $600 back up to $800. Now, you're not gaining or losing any money uh, in, this, in this transaction necessarily because you still have that net $200 loss. It's just what's happened is the rebuy uh, does not have the cost basis of the price entry of $6. It has the cost basis of $6 
plus the $2 loss or difference uh, that you had from your loss, raising your total cost basis to $8. So if you later sell the stock for $1,000, your taxable gain is going to be $200 instead of 400, okay? And the reason is because the gain from 800 to 1,000 still exists in that situation, but you don't have to pay on the difference between the $6 and the thousand dollars because your cost base is increased so it's a net zero as in terms of uh the trading activity but you should realize that because you held it for so long you've actually triggered a capital gain which is the eight hundred dollars to a thousand so understand that uh is the way it works and this could happen if you sold months later you're still only going to be taxed on that two hundred dollars the total round trip of all of the transactions should have been a net zero, but you have to pay capital gains because the loss being disallowed and added to your capital, uh, I'm sorry, your uh, cost basis from the previous trade does actually equate to a gain on that second trade, the buy of 600. Okay, so that's kind of the way it works. It's important to understand that. It does uh, generate a, a little bit more of a tax situation, but again, back to the, the uh, capital gains, net capital gains calculator. If in your current year, you are paying more in estimated capital gains tax than uh, you do have on the, your, your overall uh, actual capital gains, you need to double check that with an accountant because there are other things uh, that could be reported and managed accordingly. So a few other things, the higher cost basis decreases the size of any future gains as well. So if it went from $1,000 to $1,200, likewise, you wouldn't be paying capital gains on 600, you would only be paying capital gains on four because of that addition or added money to the capital gains. The reason why this was put into place is because it was a very common practice for rich people to buy up security throughout the year, sell it on December 31st and buy it back on January 1st uh, so that they could report the loss for the previous year, thus lowering their overall tax obligation. So this was put into place to say, hey, hold up, slow down. You need to pay your rightful share of taxes based on what your overall gains were and trying to offset it with the losses is no longer acceptable. It wasn't acceptable to begin with, by the way, but people tried it Anyways, they still try it today. If you wanted to sell a security to take a loss, but didn't want to be out of the market for the entire month to avoid the rule, what could you do? Nothing, honestly. Because the rule says uh, to buy the same or substantial security. So if you are trying to tax loss harvest, and again, this is an advanced strategy for bigger portfolios that makes sense sometimes. But if you still have conviction on a position, that it's going to perform well, it does not make sense mathematically other than to try to avoid some tax obligation to sell at a loss with the intent of buying it back because you're still bullish or convicted on the overall move. So the guidance is just stay put, just hold it, all right? Don't, don't try to skirt this rule because uh, you don't know, and neither do I, uh, what the stock is gonna be in 30 days. Okay, you can roughly guess where it will be in the next hour or the next day of trading, but you're not going to have any idea uh, what could happen over a 30 day time period. Okay, if it's an individual company, they could get hit by a meteor. If it's if it's a global ETF, an exchange or a government could get hit by a meteor. You just don't know. So it, it, doing tax loss harvesting is being tracked now uh, to a higher level. And that's the whole purpose of this. This is not to punish day traders. This is not to punish active traders. Because again, you're tacking on the cost basis as you go. If you have a successful track record of trading, the watch sale is not going to trigger because it only triggers on losses. If you do lose, However, just keep in mind that the loss is tacked on to the next purchase after the fact, and you're not being double taxed now on the potential gains, okay? You're still only being taxed on what your net gains are, and it's increasing your cost basis so that you're not being overtaxed on the transactions. I'm not sure what other questions you've got, but uh, if you do see this video and you've got more questions, go ahead and come on over and visit us on Twitch. I am live uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 1 p.m. Eastern, generally till about 5 p.m., sometimes a little bit later, and we talk about and take live questions every day. The next thing I wanna talk about, now that we've got wash sale taken care of, is what is the pattern day trading rule and how to avoid 
breaking it. I've done a few conversations on this. Uh, I've showed in the past a uh, projection sheet that kind of helps people uh, track or figure out what your actual take home is going to be from a, an active trading approach to your portfolio. And, and I've done a lot of analysis on this. I've got 19 years of finance experience. I've coached people from the hyperactive I trade 300 plus times in a single day to the passive active investors who are trading, you know, once or twice a week to the uh, long-term investors. Just tell me what to buy and hold in my portfolio for the next 20 years and, and everything that falls within those extremes, which is pretty much every investor. And, and I can say unequivocally without hesitation that you are not getting yourself a major advantage by trying to day trade a small uh, account. Realistically, if you've got about $5,000 and you stick to the PDT rules and you're active and actually successful, even if you are successful, uh, at the end of the year, that $5,000 could increase to say 11,000 after taxes, you're going to have to pay some taxes on it. That equates to the amount of time that you're putting in getting paid about 69 cents per hour committed to active trading. So don't feel like you're missing out just because you're in a small account and the system is telling you do not day trade. They're saying it for a reason uh, because day traders frequently blow up their accounts. Even experienced day traders uh, do this from time to time. There's a very different approach when it comes to active trading versus long-term investing. And at the end of the day, the real power in the stock market is time in the market long-term investing. You're going to see a lot of other channels out there saying I took $200 to $200,000 and all of these uh, extravagant, uh, grandiose claims. What they don't tell you is how much risk uh, they took on, how lucky uh, they got to get in front of the right trend at the right time, and how infrequently that ability to produce that type of return actually is. These are uh, the equivalent of uh, lottery ticket buyers in the stock market. Honestly, they take the uh, event, they put in a low amount of capital uh, to risk, and they just hope that it pays off. The reality is, on a regular basis, this type of uh, performance is not normal, and, and it's rarely replicatable. However, other traders exist out there who have portfolios of several hundred thousand dollars. They have been actively learning how to day trade for six to 10 years, and they're able to uh, consistently pull off $20,000 a day or more in day trading. Okay. That is another exception, but they have replicatable success because they have put in the time and they have the capital to make it happen. But your $5,000 portfolio, your $10,000 portfolio, your $200 portfolio is not going to experience those types of returns on a regular basis. I say all of that uh, with conviction because I talk to too many people who think they're being disadvantaged by the PDT rule. And the reality is, even if you did have access to pattern day trading, you're not going to find uh, those levels of success in the market. It's just not going to happen. So with that in mind, let's talk about the PDT rule. Uh, what is a pattern day trader? It is an open and close uh, on the same day. That's what a day trade is. So you can buy a security and sell it in the same trading day, or you can short sell a security and buy it back uh, in the same trading day. That is what a day trade is. To become pattern day trader, the base threshold from your broker uh, is that you have uh, four, okay, four or more day trades in a five uh, trading day period, okay? Weekends, and uh, holidays do not count. So if you trade uh, a day trade, buy and sell on the same day on Monday, you buy and sell on the same day again on Tuesday. All right, so that's two day trades. Now, uh, you can do a third day trade without getting triggered as PDT on Friday, as an example, okay? If you do that, that is three uh, counted rolling uh, trades. However, if Monday is a holiday, and you try to uh, day trade again on Tuesday, technically that first trade hasn't fallen off. So wait until Wednesday, the trade is off and you can uh, institute another day trade. It's not recommended, but that is how you avoid uh, the pattern day trade designation on your account 
in a small account. Uh, you should also be aware, though, that the uh, FINRA regulatory guidance says if your broker suspects that you are indeed uh, engaging in active pattern day trading, they still have the right to uh, add uh, or designate your account as a pattern day trader. If you get that designation, there's an immediate lock that goes on the account and it says that you are not allowed to trade in the account without a minimum equity of $25,000 or more. So my standing guidance is if you're interested in learning the path of day trading, you need to start with capital of at least 50,000. I could argue if you've got good experience and, and uh, you've got a good track record and discipline, you might even be able to successfully day trade account as low as $30,000. But the point is, if you have an account that you want to actively trade, you need more capital than uh, that minimum threshold of $25,000 is because even a good and experienced trader is going to take losses at times. And if your account dips below $25,000, you are frozen from actively trading. All you can do is sell positions or buy back shorts until you raise up the capital uh, over 25,000 again. So with that in mind, I will definitively say you need more capital than the 25,000 uh, for the rule. And again, the amount of effort you're putting into day trading doesn't always equate to as much as you hoped. Even if you do hit that home run and you turn the $200 into $1,200 as an example, the amount of time and effort it took to find uh, said trade and set up for a day trade uh, was exponential. And again, you're not going to find the same success very quickly uh, in the market. They come, there's always an opportunity in the market, but uh, the ability to, to replicate success at that level just is statistically not feasible. Other things for uh, day trading, you can switch your account from margin to cash to uh, get around that uh, 25,000 minimum equity requirement. However you do so, you're now subjected to stock settlement, which is T plus two, meaning if you sell a stock, you cannot buy a new stock uh, with, uh, well, is security because it could be stocks, uh, ETFs, options. Uh, you cannot, well, options settle in one day. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, stocks or ETFs, if you buy the equity again, you're now required to hold it until the settlement of the sale. So three days, basically. The day of the trade plus two days for settlement is three. And that that's a much slower pace. And again, you're still not getting real access to day trading because if you switch it to cash, then if you buy on one day, sell the same day, uh, you cannot buy again until it settles. So that is now one day trade every three days instead of three day trades every five days. So keep that in mind. Uh, what are the consequences? There's the possibility of your account being closed. There is definitely uh, the $25,000 minimum requirement. If you do not do any day trades whatsoever for 90 days. Your broker has the uh, eligibility to possibly remove that designation. Other brokers are stricter. They require one year of not trading before they will take it off. And they only grant a one-time exception to the suspension of the rule for some brokers, which means uh, if you've already had PDT removed from your account once and you trigger it again, then they'll tend to just leave it on. Because again, the act of day trading is not giving you in a small account uh, and enough of, a, enough of a, an advantage. And if you can't handle the risk tolerances of holding a security overnight, then active trading probably isn't for you yet until you have a better understanding of capital requirements and risk management, portfolio management, uh, bankroll management, and all of these additional concepts because we get so focused in on uh, the, the grandiose claims, some of the other channels of I took nothing uh, and made it into $100,000 and, and we get into our minds that this is going to be us, when in reality, it probably isn't. There's a reason why it's said that 90% of traders fail and actually lose money. And that's because uh, if you are setting up your assumptions and assessments and projections off of somebody else's work, it's probably going to be missing data that was required for them to be successful. It's, it's one of the things on my platform I talk about on a regular basis. Don't trade because somebody else trades because you're setting yourself up to fail. They have different risk tolerances. They have different analysis for entry and exit points, and you're not going to successfully replicate someone else. It's just not going to happen.
So there you have it, three topics, taxes for capital gains, the wash sale rule, and pattern day trader. Hopefully you found this information helpful. If you did, uh, go ahead and come join us on Twitch at some time. Here on YouTube, I'd like you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button, share it with somebody, tell me you like it, tell me you don't, talk in the comments, whatever you wanna say. I will try to respond, but honestly, if you want a response, click the Discord link, come join our community, and throw your questions there. Active uh, in that community every single day. Somebody will be more than happy to help uh, welcome you and get you on your way to success. So there you have it. That's all I've got today. This is Brian with Where Rebels Are. We are signing off, and I hope to see you on Twitch.